In this constant commitment to amplify the reflections and public participation, the directors of the innovative teaching group Di Paso, Marta Lora Tamayo Balbe, Professor of Administrative Law and Antonio Lopez Peláez, Professor of Social Work, will be offering a new topic today, lobbying. In the next 22 minutes, they will be interviewing Rafael Rubio Núñez, Chair of the Participation and Transparency Council of the Community of Madrid. They will be talking about lobbying. They will be talking about its meaning, its creation and its role in society, as well as the regulation of this activity that has been carried out for more than two centuries and that in Spain has many connotations attached. Not all of them are positive. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on when you are listening to us. Welcome to a new session of the series Outlooks on Public Participation, carried out in the framework of the participatory group, a partnership agreement between UNED and the City Council of Madrid. Today with us is, as usual, Antonio López Pelet. How are you? Antonio, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. But today we also have an incredible guest. We have Rafael Rubio Núñez, Professor of Constitutional Law at the Complutense University of Madrid. He's also the Chair of the Council of Public Participation and Transparency of the Community of Madrid. How are you doing, Rafa? Hello, good morning to everyone. I would like to tell you a little bit about how we came up with the idea for this session. Rafael published a an important headline in El País newspaper talking about lobbies and interest groups and we found it very interesting because we had never approached this topic. We have always spoken about participation, about stakeholders, groups, etc. But we haven't focused on something as particular as lobbies. It's true that they exist and we do not have to demonize them. And I think that Rafa explains this really well. So my first question for you, Rafa, because as you know, our audience, the audience of this show is very varied. There are more and less technical profiles between our listeners. So the first question is, what is the origin of a lobby? What does lobby mean? Could you give us a little bit of the context of lobbies and the relationship with participation? Well, we tend to understand lobbies as groups of people and uh, organizations who are defending a specific interest before public entities or public authorities. But this definition, from the legal point of view, generates many questions, doubts, and uh, it doesn't answer everything. So focusing on a very specific meaning leads to many legislation-related conflicts. Can a law firm be identified as a lobby or the Protestant church? Can these be considered lobbies? Because at the end of the day, this definition is really broad, but it tends to make it difficult to specify when we can say that a participation task is being carried out by a lobby or not. We're talking about organized groups. Or are these participation activities the result of non-organized actions, even though this wouldn't be accurate either, of the civil society organizations? Modern lobbies were born at the end of the 19th century because there were groups of people surrounding power. There are two versions, one from the US and one from the UK. The most powerful version is the one that says that lobbies were the groups that surrounded the president of the US when he was smoking outside in the balcony because they were trying to approach the president outside the White House. So we have updated the role of lobbies a lot. We haven't always detached the word lobby from the word corruption. Big lobbying scandals have uh, boosted changes in legislation in this regard, but uh, I think that we have professionalized the term lobby to turn it into an instrument or a tool for citizen participation. 
how interesting for those listening to us i mean if we think about societies as additions of or groups of people without any interaction among them we can talk about participation without grouping ourselves but that's the opposite of what happens in societies of course we form groups we have the same professional or common local regional interests which are legitimate so consensus and agreement in society is normally revolving the resources that are so scarce this explains the existence of lobbies not only in the most negative sense of the word but also the capacity we have to organize ourselves often in modern dynamics of politics we talk about marketing of political groups when you want to put pressure surrounding the demands of specific collectives that are imposed in the public agenda in this regard there are prejudices around the use of the word which has negative connotations as Rafael has just said, we are trying to regulate against excesses, but the reality is that we should perceive this within organization of complex societies. We are grouped according to our interests, so it's important just to put these interests on the table. And I love this sentence. The lack of transparency means theft. I don't know if it's too radical, but I believe that prejudices would b disappear if we were able to put our interests on the table and debate them openly. I agree with you. It's surprising when we follow debates around legalization and legitimization of lobbies, the most skeptical parties to regulating lobbies are the ones that oppose shedding light on them. If we look at data from 1978, Manuel Fraga tried to constitutionalize the regulation of lobbies through an organic act and the article of the constitution that he proposed and that was rejected generated a fascinating discussion about the role of lobbies in societies and those opposing the text its inclusion in the constitution were the most skeptical ones to the regulation of lobbies might seem contradictory because those who see or perceive lobbies as threats should try to find solutions to avoid or reduce the threat. But instead, what happens is what has sometimes been called the ostrich strategy, thinking that if we do not regulate lobbies or we don't put the topic on the table, lobbies will cease to exist because we don't see it. But instead, it creates a shady area where more inadequate ways of lobbying take place. I think we need to be more natural, we need to put lobbies on the table, and we also need to confront something that you kind of said before. A legislation that goes beyond trying to avoid corruption in lobbies, and instead turning lobbies into citizen participation tools. In order to do this, there's been a huge contribution by politicians. When I did my PhD on this topic more than 25 years ago, something that caught my attention was how every time that a politician referred to the criticism that uh, their political proposals received, they blamed lobbies that were against their proposals. But the same politician talking about the groups that defended them referred to them as civil society organizations so whether a group was a lobby or not depended on whether the group was criticizing or defending their proposals and that's where all the negative connotations around lobbies come from i believe that we will only be able to correct these negative prejudice if we put lobbies on the table. I find it fascinating, the examples that you're providing, how we tell the difference between lobbies and civil society organizations depending on their attitude. But what is the difference then, legally or otherwise, between a lobby and civil society organizations or neighborhood associations or other groups who are trying to impact local decisions. Since there is a bias towards lobbies, we guess the difference, but if we want to regulate and normalize and standardize lobbies, what would be the difference between these two groups? After many years of studying this topic, it's still unclear to me. I like to be provocative and say that lobbies don't exist. The only thing that exists is the action of lobbying. Because I understand how difficult it is to tell the difference between different groups, lobbies are instruments, are tools, strategic tools with endless types of actions. 
it's basically a tool used by different natured groups to try to impact public agendas. When we've tried to tell the difference between lobbies and other groups, we have been very unfair and we have created very inappropriate legislation that didn't cover reality because at the end of the day, if the action they are carrying out is the same thing, telling the difference between subjects, then in my opinion, it leads to democratic problems. Why is citizen participation by a company? Why is this necessarily more legitimate than the action of an NGO? Or, or to what extent different NGOs defending opposite views literally why should they be discriminated depending on their nature? I don't know if I'm explaining myself well. It's an extremely complex topic which leads us to the failure of most regulations about lobbies. Trying to focus on the subject, probably because of the negative connotation attached to lobbies in not only the Spanish society but worldwide, this has neglected the fact that the action carried out is the same and that for me is more relevant. How interesting. Definitely, we need to recognize their capacity potential. Both people, entities, grouping themselves to follow targets. This is not abstract. This is a trend, a project, a future, an immediate future that we want to build together. So the key here is to put legitimacy and disparity of opinions on the table and the means that are at our disposal to try to influence public agendas. Transparency allows us to express ourselves in equal conditions. We need to give a voice to different types of institutions knowing that some have a more powerful voice than others. Can you give us examples for clarification to our audience, so examples of lobbies in different groups and whether our model is the predominant one or if there are other models that are less conflictive or asymmetrical if we think about the proposals of different groups of society. I think that the lobby regulation model is standardized, uniform. In 1996, the Clinton administration promoted the first uh, US regulation. Actually, there was one before in the 40s, but it was cancelled because of a decision of the Supreme Court. But in 1996, the first regulation in the US was approved around lobbies and it has been reformed throughout 25 years. The OECD has promoted a regulation model based basically on the existence of a registry that is voluntary, but that should be mandatory, but there are difficulties legally. So there needs to be transparency as to who is carrying out these actions. This transparency covers specific actions, but also the subjects of these actions. What I mean with this is the organizations that are lobbying, the topics that they are lobbying about, and what governments, ministries, and public authorities they are lobbying to, and the money that they are spending on these kinds of actions, more or less, approximately. The US legislation originally made it mandatory to disseminate any spending over 15 dollars that is even the taxi to get to the capital so this regulation model encouraged very strongly by the OECD and as taken on by all the states of this organization has expanded in the last 25 years to more or less the 50 countries that have regulations on lobbying. There's a model that I like a bit more, which is a model that is very rare. It's a model inaugurated by Chile in 2016. It's a model that seeks not to create a registry, but to register actions. Any subject suffering or being the target of lobbying actions needs to register this lobbying action in a public registry. The action is registered and not the subject. When one registers the action, obviously, they are registering the subject. So anyone 
trying to influence public authorities will be registered in a transparent manner and subjects of lobbying actions are listed indirectly. They are basically creating a list of lobbying actions that allow us to see specifically in a more accurate manner who is trying to influence or impact public decisions or public figures. And at the same time, the overview of all of this creates a registry of lobbies or at least people who are participating actively in public life. I find this Chilean initiative really fascinating. In the participatory group, we count on many members from Latin America. In this regard, maybe not in a more procedural way, but they are way ahead of us in terms of participation. Rafa, do you believe that this model more action-based and subject-based could get to Spain. You are the chair of the Transparency Council. Could we maybe get started with legislation or otherwise so that lobbying processes are more action-based than subject-based so that we can leave behind the demonization of lobbies? I think it's very difficult because at the end of the day, we are in OECD territory. So in a way, we follow their regulation model. The two regulation proposals that were open until yesterday when the chambers were dissolved, the regulation of lobbies before the executive powers and the reform of the regulation of legislative power focused on the acts of lobbies before legislative powers adopted their subject-based model, but I think there are elements that we could replicate. For instance, focusing on equality and participation, I like to say that the biggest problems that lobbies have without minimizing other problems is, is not corruption, but inequality. It's not the fact that there are illegitimate actions this is covered by our legal framework, regardless of the existence of a lobby regulation or not. But the fact that the, I mean, the biggest problem is the different access they have. It seems paradoxical, but attempts to regulate lobbies in a comprehensive manner raise the bar for access. It's much more difficult for those who have fewer resources to lobby. They normally can't access or can't influence public authority. So I think that the Chilean legislation is much better because if there's a lobbying action, public authorities need to take into account the opinion of any subject that wants to demand a hearing about this same topic. The action needs to be registered. As I was saying, lobbies stop being something forbidden and they turn into something almost mandatory. It's mandatory for public powers to receive these lobbies. They are forced to hear society. This is deeply rooted in some cultures, but in Spain, it's an ordeal to get to public powers. How interesting. I think that it's very important for those listening to us because in the participatory group, we like to be not only legislation based, but to be disruptive. Part of the stigma against lobby stems from our conception of society. We work as a team, we fight for common demands and that's where lobbies come in or any other organized interest-based group. I love this idea of uh, registry based on activity. To finish the program, if you had to give us two good ideas to stimulate the participation in the lobby environment or to increase the number of stakeholders. Based on your research about lobbies to enhance transparency, for instance, in debates about the advancement of technology and science in the 70s in Europe, there have been many projects to give voice to those groups in society that don't have a voice so that not only in industrial stakeholders and experts can participate, but also citizens. 
it's like trying to amplify or to get initiatives from citizens. If you had to give us your point of view from the Council of Transparency and Public Participation, what would you say? We need to put an end to this negative logic to understand that lobbies are at the disposal of everyone in society. We should all have the option to lobby. This normally comes from the uh, organization of groups or the professionalization of certain activities. One of the biggest problems we face is that when citizen participation projects are open, those participating don't receive relevant prior information or they don't have the basic knowledge to make this participation effective. In many public participation processes, there's a sense of disappointment. Citizens feel that they've wasted their time, that it has led nowhere. So we need to get everybody to understand that they can lobby too. It's at everyone's disposal. And for this first target to be achieved, public authorities need to be open to welcoming society's input. Authorities need to consider that their relationship with lobbies is not marginalized or it's something that is rare or that should be kept a secret or to be discreet about. It needs to be mandatory and necessarily public. From this perspective, lobbies that are so informal will be institutionalized through specific channels and they will become normal, conventional means of public participation. I love how you express yourself. It's clear that this is the topic of your PhD because you explained yourself really clearly. You expressed yourself so passionately and so accurately. It's been a privilege to count on you, to interview you. We take notes on the fact that you are in the Council of Transparency. That is an amazing opportunity for us. So we hope to invite you to many other programs. It will be my pleasure. Bye, Rafa. See you soon. Bye.